Soil is the foundation for every agricultural operation, from large-scale industrial farms to small home gardens. Understanding the basics of soil science may make the difference between a successful operation and one that fails. The subject of soil science stretches far beyond what we can cover in a 10-minute video. However, this introduction should give you a better understanding of what it is and why soil science is important. There are three major aspects of soil to consider, the physical, the chemical, and the biological aspects. We will explore each of these aspects and the roles that they play in determining a good soil in this video. The physical characteristics are the things we can see when we look at the soil and how the soil responds to the environment. These aspects include texture, aggregation, and structure. Texture refers to the percentages of sand, silt, and clay that make up the soil. To illustrate the relative differences in these particle sizes, we've laid out the scale model using stones and sand. The larger rocks represent the sand particles, the red aquarium gravel represents the silt particles, and finally the small black sand in the picture represents the clay particles. In reality, sand particles are less than 2 millimeters and clay particles are less than 2 thousandths of a millimeter. Particle sizes are an important aspect of soil because they influence how well soil holds on to water and nutrients. The key is surface area. Water holds on to the surfaces of the particles, so the greater the surface area, the better the soil holds water. Likewise, nutrients bind to the various locations on the surfaces of soil particles, so the greater the surface area of the particles, the better the soil holds nutrients. To emphasize the relationship among water, nutrients, and surface area, think of a cup full of sand versus a single cup-sized stone. There are many more binding sites on the cup of sand than there are on the equivalent volume of stone. This is why clayey soils tend to hold on to nutrients but have poor drainage, while sandy soils don't hold on to nutrients well but dry out quickly. Soil particles also weather and break down, which releases minerals into the soil for the plants to take advantage of. Clayey and silty soils weather and slough off more new minerals faster than sandy soils because of their greater surface area. Soil surfaces have areas with positive and negative charges, which are important for forming soil aggregates. Aggregation is how the soil particles bind with each other to create clumps in the soil. Clayey soil particles bind together easily because they have more charged locations, while sandy soils have fewer binding sites and tend to stay looser. Think of a walk down the beach. Sands don't tend to form aggregates, but rather they tend to stay as individual grains of sand. The ability of soils to form aggregates is determined by both the soil texture and the amount of organic matter present in it. When soil aggregates form, they contain smaller spaces between the particles that make up the aggregate, and they provide larger spaces between the aggregates themselves. Both the large and the small spaces, or pores, are very important for water, air, and root movement through the soil. Since these pores are important for plant health, it's important for the aggregates to remain stable. Aggregates that are not stable can break down from being watered or rained on, and the resulting small particles can clog and seal the pores within the soil, forming a crust and basically cutting off the water, air, and nutrient sources for the roots. Gardeners favor loamy soils because they're a mixture of different sized particles and they get the best characteristics of each particle size, the drainage of the sands, and the nutrient holding ability of the silts and clays. An ideal topsoil will have a mixture of sand, silt, clay, and organic matter that results in half of the volume coming from the solid soil particles and the other half of the volume coming from the space between the particles. The major chemical aspects of soil that growers are concerned with are pH and nutrient levels. Both of these influence plant nutrition and both are under the grower's direct control. The pH, or acidity of something, is measured on a scale from 0 to 14, with 0 being highly acidic like battery acid, 7 being neutral like water, and 14 being highly alkali like liquid drain cleaner. Most crops prefer a slightly acidic soil with a pH between 5 and 7, while our Alaska berries thrive in acidic soils of around a pH of 4. pH influences the soil in three major ways. First, it affects the availability of nutrients. Primary nutrients such as nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium are all much more available at a pH of 6-8 than they are at a pH of 4-5. 
This means that a soil might have adequate levels of these nutrients, but under acidic conditions, they're not in a form that the plant can take up. It's kind of like being thirsty while walking on a glacier. The water is there, but not in a form that you can drink. The second way that pH influences the soil is a low pH can make aluminum and iron too available. These elements can hurt the plants when they're in high concentration. And lastly, pH affects the activity of the soil microbes, and this in turn could affect the nutrient cycling and disease aspects. So, how do we figure out what nutrients our soil needs to be healthy? We take a soil sample and send it off to the lab. To take a soil sample, all you need is a clean shovel and a clean bucket. In order to have a good representation of the soil for the lab, you'll need to collect soil from various points in your site. To take the sample, dig a shovel full of soil out and set it aside, and then take a thin slice vertically along the edge of the hole. Remove the soil from both sides on the shovel until you have a one inch strip down the middle and put that strip of soil in your bucket. Repeat this process at each of the locations that you've selected. Mix the soil samples together and then remove about a pint of the soil and put it in a clearly labeled plastic bag. From there you'll need to follow the instructions for submitting your sample to the lab of your choice. Once you get the lab results back, your local cooperative extension agent, soil and water conservation district worker, or USDA NRCS professional can help you interpret the results. Plants don't need all the nutrients in the same amounts. Relatively speaking, plants need the primary macronutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, by the dump truck load. The secondary macronutrients, calcium, magnesium, and sulfur, are needed by the wheelbarrow load. Finally, there are a number of micronutrients which are needed in very small amounts, teaspoons rather than the truck and wheelbarrow amounts of the macronutrients. Regardless of the amount of nutrients needed, each of these nutrients are required for proper plant growth and metabolic processes. Another important thing to address in terms of healthy soil is mycorrhizae. Mycorrhizae is a relationship between specific soil fungi and plant roots. These relationships help plants with phosphorus absorption, water uptake, and protection from disease. Mycorrhizae is often mentioned on commercial soil packaging as an additive that improves plant health. Unfortunately, most mycorrhizal fungi can't simply be added to a bag of soil to benefit the plant growth. If you want to improve this aspect of your soil, you can specifically inoculate it to introduce and improve mycorrhizal relationships. The biological component refers to the living organisms of the soil. These include everything from marmots to microbes to plant roots. The relationships among the individual organisms and populations form the soil food web. The majority of the soil food web takes place in the top 8 inches of soil in Alaska because this part of the soil has the most air and is usually the warmest. As a result, the majority of Alaska's plant roots are less than 8 inches deep, and the majority of organisms live in this range as well. The population decreases about tenfold for every 4 inches deeper we go because the lower temperatures slow down microbial decomposition, so the food web becomes less active. Just like the world we live in, the soil food web has predators, pathogens, parasites, and herbivores. In most soil food webs, plants are the starting point because they use sunlight to convert carbon dioxide from the air into sugars, carbohydrates, and other high energy compounds to provide the food. A robust food web in healthy soil will have many types of organisms that can build up organic matter through photosynthesis, such as plants, algae, and bacteria. It will also have numerous organisms that break down organic matter and control populations. There are even different organisms that chew and shred organic matter to break it down so that other microbes can work on it. One of the most important functions of the soil food web is the turnover of nutrients. As the various members of the food web carry out their functions, they help to make the nutrients available to plants. Nutrients that are tied up in the cell wall of a bacteria or in the muscles of an earthworm are not available for the plant to take up. These nutrients only become available to the plant when the microbe or animals in the soil excrete the nutrients or if the microbe's body is ripped open and the contents are released into the soil water solution. 
Beyond nutrient cycling, a healthy food web has the ability to regulate various populations and keep the levels of undesired organisms to a minimum. For example, most of the bacteria in the soil exist by breaking down organic matter for their nutrients and are harmless to plants. When there are many bacteria to be consumed, it's only a matter of time before the predator population builds up, so the population of bacteria eating protozoa increase. In general, the protozoa are fairly indiscriminate bacteria eaters, so if there are any bacteria that cause plant diseases in the soil, they're also likely to be consumed before they reach a population that would be damaging to the crop. So, in this example, bacteria that don't negatively affect the crop attract predators that eat both the non-pathogenic and any disease-causing bacteria that may be present. So, how can we as producers influence the soil food web? First, we can use techniques that add organic matter to the soil since this brings food to the system and providing food for the organisms increases their populations. And second, if it's a relatively new or damaged soil food web, we can add compost, compost tea, or manure to jumpstart the microbial community. Every agriculturalist is concerned with producing healthy, sustainable crops. The first step on this journey is to understand what healthy soil is and how to maintain it. We hope this overview has provided you a good knowledge base for understanding soil and encourages you to learn more about how to keep your soil healthy, productive, and sustainable.